Okay, hey, it's our last class. Sorry guys, it's been wonderful. So I'm glad we're outside for it. Um, so our mathematician spotlight today is Lila Fonts, by request, um, finally. And um, she's an assistant professor in the computer science department. How many of you have had pr Professor Lila Fonts for a class? Yes, good. To, you two? No? Okay. Just the one. Um, she was a math major at Harvard. Like many of you, right? You will become math majors? Yes? Good. Um, uh, she did her PhD at Toronto and her postdoc at Paris. So she speaks three languages. American, Canadian, French. It's pretty good. Um, so sh she studies privacy and its relationship to communication costs and other sorts of things. So she's actually a, a theoretical computer scientist, um, which is like a mathematician. So let this be a lesson to you. If you want to be a mathematician, which I hope many of you do, um, become a computer scientist or a statistician. It, you get to do math, but you're in much higher demand. Okay, so, so she studies privacy. So here's an idea. Suppose, so yeah, you, now you can come in here. So Ife and I, we both have an, a secret number. So I, I took all the face cards out. You're going to get a number from 1 to 10. Don't tell me anybody what it is. It's a secret number. And I'm also going to get a secret number. Okay. So the idea is we want to know the sum of our numbers because maybe we're trying to buy like a cake to celebrate what a wonderful semester it's been. So we want the sum of our numbers, but I'm not going to tell you my number. You're not going to tell me your number either, huh? I see how it is. Okay. Okay. So here's the deal. I take my number, which I'm not going to tell any of you, and I add my favorite number to it. Okay, done. And I'm going to tell it to you. Ready? 11. Now you take your number, your secret number, you add your favorite number to that, and you add that to 11. 22. 22. Okay, now I subtract off my favorite number. 17. Now you subtract off your favorite number. 16. So the sum of our numbers is 16. Is it true? Yay, it worked! Yay! Okay, so now we know the sum of our numbers, but you don't know my number. You know my number? How do you know my number? Because I just subtract my number. You just subtract your number and then you get my number. Oh. Oh. Oh, so sad. You know what we need? A friend. Okay, so since our numbers, yay! Since our numbers are no longer secret, you can put it back. And now we'll get, we'll pick new secret numbers. Okay, now we each get a secret number. You get one, you get one, and I get one. Okay, now the deal is the same. We, we want to know the sum of our numbers. But I don't want to tell you what my number is. You want to tell me what your number is? No. no. Okay. So I'm going to, once again, take my number and add my favorite number to it. But here's the deal. If I just tell everyone, then uh, we'll be able to know what everyone's number is. So we have to, has to be a secret. It has to just go in a circle. So I'm going to tell Ife the sum of my number plus my favorite number, but you cannot listen. Ready? Six. Six. Okay. Now, now you take your secret number, add your favorite number to it, and add it to my number, and give it to Douglas, and I can't listen. Yeah? And now you take your favorite number plus your number and add it to whatever he told you, and you can't listen. Say it nice. 25. 25. Okay. Okay, now, now, we know this, now we have the sum of all of our secret numbers plus our favorite numbers. Now I'm going to subtract off my favorite number and tell it to Ife, but you can't listen. 20. Uh oh, uh oh. It's okay, it's okay. Try again. It's okay. 20. 10. Wait. You sure? 12. So now we know 12 is the sum of all of our numbers. Is it true? Hey, it worked! Nice, yeah. The same transformation is being observed by the same person twice. I.e., you're adding and then subtracting your favorite number, and you could theoretically use that to construct the number. I think that's why we have to go in the order that we went in. Well, yeah, I mean, switching, like if you go in the circle one way, wouldn't you want to then obviously, obviously go in the other way? Go in the other way. Is that what we want? Okay, so you, you said six, right? Speak nice and loud. You said six, right? I said six for mine. So you got six from yours, and then you said our max was, or our total was 25, right? 25 was yeah. the sum of all of our numbers. And then you told him 20. I told him 20. 
So then he knows to take off. He knows to take off five. five. So then, yeah, he can So we had to do it in the other order. Oh, we should do it in the other order. Good call. Shucks. What? You heard about it last night, so you figured it out last night. Nice. Okay. I don't think so. Yeah, I did this right. We have to always go back in the other order. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Good. Good. I should have asked for clarification, perhaps, but this is good that we 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 debugged it on the spot. Nice. All right. Well done. Thank you. Okay, now the sun has come out. It was supposed to stay away. It's partly cloudy. Partly cloudy. Partly cloudy. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So um, for today on the notes, um, I prepared um, an example that puts together three things. Um, in order to do this one integral, you have to use Stokes' theorem, Gauss's theorem, and a triple integral. But then um, in reading your um, surveys and also talking to some of you in office hours, um, it seemed like the biggest issue people were having was like not really getting the big picture. Like there are all these little things we know how to do, but you don't, weren't sure how they fit together. So I thought what we should do in this last day is sort of put everything together and talk about all the things that you've learned and, and the whole point. So, so this is like, like when the, when the speaker has a speech prepared and then they're like, I'm not gonna give this speech, I'm gonna tear up my speech. So um, I'm not gonna do the front, ha the front page, but I will do uh, the back page. Okay. So. Okay, so before you came into this class, you knew how to integrate single variable functions. So the way you think about that is like, so here, um, single variable integration. Okay, so the way you can think about that is like you have the real line here, and to each point on the real line, you're given some function value. So to each point, you have f of x, uh, giving a value to each point. Um, but that's not a super easy way to think about it. The way we usually think about it is like we take this value f of x and we draw it up here above. So there's f of x. Here's the y-axis. Um, and then maybe you want to know, you want to add up all your function values from a to b. Well, first we approximate it maybe with little rectangles, um, but then we use an integral to add up the whole thing. So we add up from a to x equals a to x equals b of f of x dx. Um, but the way to, I mean, the way to think about it that generalizes to higher things is just the f of x associates to each point on the real line x here a value, and you can add them up. Okay? Um, so you came in here knowing how to do that and having lots of, of good techniques to do that. Um, then the first thing that we learned to do on this topic um, is we learn to do double integrals. So the idea here is that you have some region in the plane, like maybe it's uh, the, the spot of grass here in the front, um, and you have a function that assigns to each point a value. So to each point in your little spot of grass, there's maybe like the thickness the um, thickness of the grass, yeah. And that's a nice way to think about it. At each point you have a function value, but the way we usually do it is that we draw this in, in perspective. So here, here was the x-axis, here was the y-axis. Now we sort of take this picture and tilt it back. So here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. And then our lump, our little region is there. And then you imagine to each point, um, f of x, y associates some value. So you get this surface sitting over the top. So here's f of x, y 
as the z values. So we think of this, even though it's just a two-dimensional thing with a function value at each point, we think about it as a three-dimensional thing sitting over that. And you learn to do this. So the way you learn to do this um, was we set up a double integral over this region r, or this region r, of f of x, y, d, a. Um, and sometimes it was tricky to set up these bounds of integration r for r, because, I mean, if it was this blob, maybe you need a whole bunch of different pieces, or maybe you'd want to switch to polar coordinates, I don't know. But we have some techniques for setting up that region. Um, but then once you get this function, it's just like a single variable integral. You just do it twice, uh, with one variable at a time. So you know how to do double integrals. And then we did triple integrals. So um, on your survey that you filled out last time, I asked you what's your favorite part of the class and what was your least favorite part of the class. And for a lot of you, you wrote triple integrals were your favorite part of the class. So that's so cool. Um, I do, th yeah, not you, that wasn't you? Oh, okay. So, because they're kind of fun. So triple integrals, once again, you imagine that you have some chunk of stuff and maybe since it's such a beautiful day, um, this is like um, a chunk of delicious ice cream floating in the air. And you want to know the total deliciousness of your chunk of ice cream. Now, if it were some just like nice chocolate ice cream, it would be the same all the way through. So you could just take deliciousness times volume and get the total. But maybe it varies, right? You've got some delicious uh, swirl that runs through and then some little chunks of caramel or something in there. So you, you, it's different at every point. So you have a function. Now it's f of x, y, z. Uh, that assigns to each point of your chunk like a deliciousness and you want to add it up. Well, it's hard to draw a picture um, like this because we need a fourth dimension. So you just have to imagine that you have a function value at each point and you're going to add them up. So to do that, we add up the triple integral over our region. Now in the end of the course, we've been calling a solid region E. So let's call it E of f of x, y, z, d, v. So for each little point, you put it in a small box. Maybe if you're using rectangular coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, it's a rectangular box. And then you say, OK, for in our box, here's our function value multiplied by the volume of that box on which it takes on that function value. And then you add it up over the whole solid. Um, if you were using cylindrical or spherical coordinates, your box wouldn't wouldn't have wouldn't be a rectangular box it would be a bit curved on the sides but it's the same idea so we add up our function value over each little point inside our region yeah yeah so you came in knowing how to do one kind of integral a single variable integral and after something like halfway through the course you could do double and triple integrals amazing and i think you can see how you could do quadruple quintuple integrals if you needed to. Same idea. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So what's the point here? But here's the thing. Now, this is so useful. If what you want to integrate over is a piece of the x-axis. But, I don't know, when you go about your daily life, how many of you are like finding the x-axis just sitting around that you're interested in? Not that much. So an ind somewhere it might come up is like, suppose this were time here, and um, f of t gave you your speed. Uh, then this is like f of t is your speed. Ah, uh, yes. So this will come up later when we point out that it's a windy day. That was demonstration. It's a windy day. OK, so time is an example of something that really is much, much like an axis. It just like marches along. Yeah, it's still blowing away. Is it people's homework now? No, it's still the same speech. OK, fine. OK. Um, but what if it's not just an axis? What if, for instance, you have um, like a blade of grass? It's kind of like an axis, but 
it's not straight. It's got some curve going on. And I want to integrate along this, this blade of grass. What am I going to do? I don't know. I can't use this unless I like straighten it out. So what we need here is a scalar line integral, which is actually a scalar curve integral. So what you have is you have some curve, like this beautiful blade of grass, C. And you, perhaps you have a function that assigns to each point of this blade of grass some value. Like maybe instead of being a human, which doesn't eat grass, you are a bug, which does eat grass. And so to each point on this grass, you have a function that this assigns deliciousness. Why not? So um, to each point on this blade of grass, you have some function like f of x, y, z. Um, assigning deliciousness to it. Um, f of x, y, z, you kind of think of the, the curve as sitting in space and the function assigning a value to every point in space. So the deliciousness metaphor breaks down a little bit. But we want to know like what's going on at every point of this curve, which is a curve but isn't a piece of the x-axis. So what should we do? Well, we wish to integrate over the curve f of x, y, z, d, s. This is a little s. It means just like a little increment along the curve, little ds. So it's the, the value of the function at a, at a point times like the length along the curve over which you attain that value. Um, and the easiest way to do this, the way that we've been doing it, um, is to imagine that you're just a bug moving around along the line, along the curve, at each, and you know where you are at each time. So you want to parameterize the curve So C is um, X of T is like X of T, Y of T, Y of T, Z of T for uh, T between A and B. So then you imagine that you're here at time A, you're at the end at time B, and this function like X of T tells you where you are at any, at any time. And then you can write this as the integral from t equals a to t equals b of f of x, y, z times um, the length of time, uh, the, the times, again, the length along the curve for which you attain that value. So the magnitude of the velocity vector times dt. So this ds became this whole thing uh, because this is like a little increment of time. And this is a speed. So in total, speed times time gives you distance um, along the curve uh, for which f takes that value. So, so that's the idea. You want to add up a func function values, not along the x-axis, but along something that's curved in space. Well, same idea, add up the function value times a little increment, but now it's curved. Huh. Huh. Then we might take our blade of grass with our ant crawling along it and hold it up into the wind. I see there is wind, your hair is moving. So you might, the ant might reasonably want to know if it's trying to crawl from this end to that end, is that wind going to hurt it or help it along its way? So that would give, that would be, in order to compute that and figure that out, you would need a vector line integral. So here you imagine you have this um, curve and now it matters which way you're going. It matters whether t we start here and end here or whether we start there and end here. So let's suppose we're going along this way. And now we have some vector field, which you can think of as the wind doing something along the curve, okay? And you want to know whether it's going to help you or hurt you. So what you want to do is add up along the curve your vector field dot d little s. Okay. So this pink thing is our vector field. 
And so at each point, you look at the direction you're going, d little s, like a tiny vector in the direction that you're going, and you want to know, is it pointing the same direction as my vector field or not? And that's what a dot product measures. A dot product measures how much two vectors point in the same direction. So at each point, you say, hey, hey, wind, are you helping me or hurting me? If you're going in the same direction down here, this number would be positive. Then here in the middle somewhere, um, the vector field is perpendicular to the curve, so it's zero. And then here at the end, the vector field is going in the opposite direction, so it's negative. So this function values that you're adding up along the curve here are like how much it's helping you or hurting you. Um, the way we compute this is it's the integral over c of f dot unit, unit tangent vector ds. So this is like a unit vector in the direction you're going times the amount, like the distance that you're going in that direction. So this little ds is the same as this little ds, um, but over here it's a vector quantity. Okay. And then if we parameterize the curve as before, so we'll use the same parameterization. Our curve is x of t, which is x of t, y of t, z of t, for t between a and b. Then this is the integral from t equals a to t equals b of um, our vector field, and then plug in where you are at time t. That, so that tells you the way that the vector field is pointing at time t, and then dot product with x prime of t dt. So the idea here is at time t, this is the direction that the vector field is pointing, and then x prime of t is your velocity vector. So that's the direction that you're going, but you don't want to go like the entire length of the velocity vector, you want to multiply it by dt to just go a little bit in that direction. So, and again, this measures how much these two things are pointing in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah. Questions or ideas? Yeah. Okay. So, then what happens? Well, well, we can do double integrals over regions of the xy plane, but like even the example I gave, I mean, I gave an example that maybe our region was the patch of grass in the front here, and our function was how lush the grass was at each point. But this isn't the piece of the xy plane, it's curvy. So it's, it's really a surface. So, we don't really, so we'd like to be able to integrate not over, not just over area regions of the xy plane, but over area regions of surfaces. So for that, we'll need a scalar surface integral. So um, here's our surface. So it looks something like this, maybe. Um, and to each point, we have a function. That assigns some value. So here's our surface S. This was again our curve C. Now it's our surface S. Um, and we have a function. F of X, Y, Z. Um, that assigns to each point a value. So it's a bit tough to draw a picture like we did over here where the function value is sitting over it because the surface itself is already curved. So you could imagine, like I, I always try to figure out how to visualize this. Um, I, you might imagine that the surface is different colors, like it's white if it has a negative value and it's black, if it has a positive value and gray is zero or something like that. Just it's hard to, hard to do a, a big a three dimensional picture of what's going on because the surface is already sort of in three dimensions. But anyway, you have a function assigned to each point in your surface um, a value, and you want to add them up. So to do that, you take the double integral over the surface of f of x, y, z, d, s. So the difference between these two is that up here, 
f of x, y, z is going to each is being assigned to each point on a curve. So it's a single integral over a curve, and we use this little s to um, to mean like a little distance along the curve. This little ds here. For the surface, we have a function x, y, z that's assigning a value to each thing, and we do d big s. And d big s you can think of as like a little patch of area on the surface. So a little patch of curved area on the surface. A little infinitesimal one. So to do this, we take the double, so to do this, um, first we have to parameterize the surface. And now s is a two-dimensional thing. Up here with our curve, our curve is only a one-dimensional thing, so we just needed one parameter for it, just little t. But here, we need two things to parameterize it. So our big surface x is a function of s and t. So it's some x of s and t, y of s and t, z of s and t, for s and t um, in some region r. Some region of the st plane that you're interested in. So for example, sometimes we parameterize a cone or a disk in par parametric uh, in, um, with r and theta, and so sometimes our r goes from 0 to 1 and our theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, that would be our region big r. Um, r goes from 0 to 1, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, like a little rectangle in the r theta plane. And once we've parameterized it, then this is the double integral over that region r of the st plane that we care about of f of x of s and t times the magnitude of xs cross xt ds dt. Okay, so the point here is that if you have some point s comma t in your in your parameter space r, the the plane of, the place the region of values that you care about, well you 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 plug f you plug that point into f to figure out what the value is of f at the corresponding point. And then this xs cross xt well, that's the um, area of a little parallelogram um, because xs is like one, one direction in your plane, xt is a different direction, and xs cross xt, well, it's, that vector gives a normal vector to the surface, but its magnitude gives the area of the little parallelogram spanned by it. So we imagine this whole thing here um, is the area of the surface um, for which f takes that value. So it's very much like the curve uh, integral. Yeah. If we normalize the cross product, it would make the magnitude of the vector 1. Yeah, so we. Um, we figured out that you, what you really are doing here is that you're normalizing and the normalizations cancel out. So there's secretly, so this, this xs cross xt isn't normalized to length one. Um, you would, general, uh, you would, we, uh, yeah, we divided by, wait, 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 wait. We do, this is not the place where we normalize. That's in vector surface integrals. So this really is the area of the, the little tiny parallelogram where you take on this value. So what's really going on here is that this is um, the vector x, s, d, s cross x, t, d, t. So it's a tiny vector in the s direction cross a tiny vector in the t direction. But then d, s and d, t are constants, so we pull them out. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, other questions or ideas? Yeah. yeah, so there's this this secret or this rule of thumb that if you ask for questions, you have to wait 10 seconds. So I did this when I was first teaching. I would um, ask if there were any questions and then I would slowly count to 10 in my head and all the way, one through nine, nobody asks a question. And then right when I say t 10, 
boom, someone asked a question. So in your seats, somebody said, I'll remember about this class, the awkward silence after Professor Davis asked for questions or ideas. Um, but there's a reason for that, which is that I have to wait 10 seconds. You'd be surprised at how often somebody asks the thing. And when it seems awkward, I'll start like saying some stuff and stalling just so that people have enough time to sort of think about things. And then you get a question. So it's kind of magical. It's magic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the last thing that we know how to do is vector surface integrals. So this, this piece of paper, it was blowing in the wind. I mean, it probably still is. Basically, blowing in the wind. So we might want to know how the wind is, is affecting it. If I hold it, now if I hold it, the wind is pressing on it. I'm somehow able to resist the force of the wind, but it's, it's true. So we have this surface now, the same surface maybe, but now we have a vector field. So uh, we have a vector field, which you can think of as the wind, uh, blowing through it somehow. Or you can think about it as a net and you're catching fish. But in any case, you have this vector field. And you want to know, like, how hard, for example, is my vector field pushing on my surface? Well, I'm going to get a number out as my answer. It's either going to be positive or negative. I have to decide which way I want to be positive. So you have to give your surface some orientation. Let's decide that our surface is oriented like that way, like down. So that way this, vector, this number would come out positive. Like the vector field is pushing on your surface. So this is a vector surface integral. And what you want to add up is at each point, you add up f dot d s. Now this ds is like an oriented bit of surface. It's a bit of surface along with the oriented normal vector. So at each point you're adding up how much is f pointing in the same direction as my oriented surface and like for how much area. So the way we add this up is it's the double integral over r of f dot unit normal vector uh, d big S. Um, and so sometimes we're able to just compute it directly this way. Like if our surface is horizontal, then our unit normal vector is just 0, 0, 1, pointing directly up. Um, but sometimes we have to actually compute something or, or parameterize the thing. So if we have to parameterize the surface, then we parameterize it as before. So we parameterize the surface as big X of, of two variables, S comma T, and we say which, which range of S and T give us the surface that we want. And then this is the double integral. Oops, this is supposed to be S. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. This is the double integral over the surface. And now this is the double integral over the region that we care about of F of our parameterization X of S and T dot um, x s cross x t d s d t. Okay. So this is for any point s t in our parameter space, the direction that the vector field is going, and then x s cross x t gives you a normal vector to the surface. The only thing is x s cross x t is going to point one direction or the other. Um, it doesn't know which direction you chose for your orientation. So this could be xt cross xs, uh, depending on orientation of s. So that's the idea. It adds up how much uh, the vector field is pointing through your surface at each point. Yeah. So the, these things are all related. I hope you can see um, how related they are. So we talked about how, or I talked about just a minute ago, how these are kind of the same thing. 
um, at each point of the curve, you're adding up the, just some values. At, and here, at every point of the surface, you're just adding up some values. And then vector line integrals and vector surface integrals are kind of the same idea as well. You have a curve and you want to know how much the vector field is pointing in the same direction as your curve. And down here you have a surface and you want to know how, how much the vector field is pointing in the same direction as your surface. Um, as long as you know what that means to have a surface that's pointing in some direction. We just mean the normal vector to the surface in the direction that we've chosen. Yeah. And by the way, you might get a bit confused about this ds with a small s, this ds with a small s that's a vector, this d big s, and this d big s that's a vector. Uh, but there, it's meant to suggest that you're kind of doing the same thing. It's not meant to be confusing. It's meant to, little s means you're going along a curve, a one-dimensional thing, and big s means you're going along a surface, a two-dimensional thing. And then um, if it's, it's a vector, if you're doing like, if you're interested in things that are directed, have an orientation and a vector field, and it's a scalar if you're just going along a curve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah. Yeah, so I, the last thing I was going to do is draw arrows between things for Gauss's theorem and Stokes' theorem. Good question. How is it all related with the theorems? Okay, so before I say that, I'll just say, like, you came in knowing how to do one kind of integral, which was um, a single integral, um, but with lots of techniques. Like, you could integrate by parts, probably, and you could integrate trig functions and polynomials and all sorts of things you could integrate. Um, and, and now, look, you can do six other kinds of integrals now. Came in with one, leaving with seven. It's pretty good. Um, of course, you needed all those skills that you learned for single variable things in order to do the, the multiple variable things, because in the end, they're all just like iterated single integrals. Yeah. So look at that. You can integrate seven things now. It's so good. OK. So now I thought I'd say how our big theorems relate these things. So let's start, let's all oh, just do them in the order in which we studied them. So Green's theorem. Green's theorem is, relates vector line integrals to double integrals in the plane. So Green's theorem relates these two. So Green's theorem says if you want to do a vector line integral over a closed curve in the plane, well, do so, take some related scalar-valued function associated to the vector field function and just integrate that as a scalar-valued double integral. Yeah. So I think Green's theorem should be green. What color should Stokes' theorem be? Hmm? Red. Red? Oh yeah, stoking the fire. It should be red. Okay, good call. So Stokes' theorem, Stokes' theorem is like Green's theorem, but where your region doesn't have to be a flat thing in the xy plane. So Stokes' theorem, the stoking the fire theorem, relates these two things: vector line integrals and vector surface integrals. So Stokes' theorem. Relates these two things. Um, and when we study Stokes' theorem, we can see that, that Green's theorem is just a special case of it when your curve happens to be in the plane. And it tells you that like this scalar-valued function that you were integrating secretly, it's really a vector surface integral. It just happens to be a special case where it was in the plane. So Stokes' theorem relates these two guys. Yeah. Oh. Can you use Stokes' theorem to go from a vector surface integral to a regular double integral? So uh, you can't. Um, the Stokes' theorem and Green's theorem are, are kind of the same theorem. It's just that Green's theorem is in the special case when your vector surface integral is over a surface that it happens to be a chunk of the xy plane. So, uh, oh. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, okay, sure. Where did you want to start with? You want to start with the vector surface integral. Yeah. Okay, you start with the vector surface integral, you turn it into a vector line integral. If 
your vector line integral is over a curve that happens to bound a flat thing, then you could turn it into Green's theorem. Okay. Maybe the nice way to think about it is that you could go the other way. You could start with a flat region, turn it into a vector line integral around the curve, and then turn it into a surface integral of any other surface that has that same boundary. Okay. Well, it was your idea. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, so the, the idea is that if, it, you, if you start with a curved surface and maybe it's, it's the curve around it is intrinsically like in three dimensions, you couldn't unfortunately go down to Green's theorem. So sad. Yeah. Oh, unless you change your coordinates to make it flat, but that might be more work. Yeah. All right, and Gauss's theorem. What color is Gauss's theorem? Purple, purple, okay. Just like these flowers and this dress. Okay, so Gauss's theorem, which is also called the divergence theorem, relates a vector surface integral over a closed surface to the solid region inside. So Gauss's theorem relates these two things. Gauss's theorem is also called the divergence theorem because um, it, it turns a vector surface integral into a scalar integral of the divergence over a solid. So Gauss's theorem turns vector surface integral over a closed surface into a triple integral over the region inside. Yeah. So uh, Gauss's theorem is basically Green's theorem of a dimension. Uh, uh, Yeah, that I'm not sure. I was trying to think about that, of a, what it would mean for a vector volume integral. Um, yeah, what would it mean for a vector volume integral? Because I know how to orient a curve. It's either going this way or that way. I know how to orient a surface. It's either like this side is the positive side or this side is the positive side. But I'm not sure how to orient a solid. So I was trying to think of that myself, actually, and I'm not sure how you would go up a dimension. I, I suppose you can but I don't know how. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah. So there are so many things you could integrate. I mean, you could integrate any of these. You could integrate four-dimensional, five-dimensional things, anything you come up with in your physics class, your engineering class, or your linguistics class, you will probably be able to integrate. Um, and it's... It's been lovely to be with you, so thank you very much. All right. Yay. Yay. All right.